Thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. It gives me great pleasure to be part of this community for this evening and to be recognised as the Elizabeth Laird Lecturer for this year. I had a hard choice what to talk about, but decided to go with my current enthusiasm, which is known as time domain astrophysics, things that vary and things that actually vary quite rapidly. So, Hubble telescope, probably quite well known to a number of you. This is a very famous picture from the Hubble telescope. It's the Hubble Deep Field. The telescope spent 143 hours in total staring at this tiny patch of the sky, a carefully chosen patch of sky. But the size is what a tennis ball at a distance of 100 metres would cover. It is tiny. Because of the long observing time, it sees very, very faint things. It sees some of the most distant things in the universe. And significantly for us as well, it sees that there is still black space between all these things. Nearly everything in this photograph is a distant star. Um, the things that aren't distant stars, there's this one with a cross, that one, and there's a star up there with a little cross through it. Since Christmas is coming, I will expand on this just a little bit. That cross shape is produced inside the telescope. For those who know a bit about telescopes, there will be a secondary mirror. It's held in place by what we call a spider. And it's that structure, that spider, that's giving the lovely cross shape. Come Christmas, you'll probably get some Christmas cards. Some may show the Christmas star. Some may show the Christmas star with a neat cross shape through it. Good theology, bad history. <laughs> that cross shape could only be produced inside a telescope, and they didn't have telescopes at the time of the birth of Christ. So it's an anachronism. So this was a few years back, the latest, most exciting thing in astrophysics, but it has some limitations. We are looking at a very small area, but they do seem to have chosen wisely. It does seem to be a typical area. We get very interesting results from it. People are still working on this data. But because of the very long exposure time, 143 hours, we are missing anything that flares, changes brightness and dies away during that 143 hours. And we're also incidentally missing anything that moves. Anything that moves might, if you're lucky, come out as a rather faint cigar shape. Anything that flares and dies, well, it'll probably get averaged out and be the faintest of smudges in the 143 hours. So whilst this produces wonderful astrophysics, there are things it cannot do. And one of the more recent developments is paying attention to the things that this kind of photograph cannot do. So it's like moving from still photographs to movies. Still photographs, very beautiful, but the movies will show you how the shape changes how things move, and how the brightness changes. And that's one of the ways that astronomy has moved in the last few years. So up till now, we have largely ignored what's called the dynamic sky. Largely. There have been some exceptions. Uh, radio astronomers studying pulsars, like you've heard described to you. Um, X-ray astronomers and gamma-ray astronomers have all been alert to this time dimension of astrophysics. So what has happened is that a number of older telescopes have been repurposed. So for example, we have here 
one of a, a famous Palomar telescope, um, a Schmidt telescope owned by the Swedes, Uppsala, but in um, Australia. And there have actually been one or two new telescopes like this one in Hawaii called Pan Stars. Uh, this is a US telescope and they got the money for it by saying it was going to spot killer asteroids. <laughs> Things that move, which might be asteroids coming to hit the Earth, which would probably be small, but might just faintly possible be killer asteroids. So make people twitchy and they'll give you money. <laughs> uh, the other two are much older but well-known telescopes. So these kinds of telescopes have now started observing, looking for optical transients. And the kind of thing we're beginning to find is there's a pair of photographs here, there and there. They're of the same patch of sky. Uh, and you can confirm that by looking at some of these pairs of stars that are around the place. Um, but here, something's gone off just to the bottom left of that bright spot which I can see as a very faint dot, but you probably can't see. That little thing, if I could hold my hand steady enough, has flared and become as bright as its neighbour. These pictures were taken a month apart. And basically what has happened is there have been developments in CCD technology and there have been developments in computing. And the combination means that we can now take many, many pictures many frames and we can use the computers to add them if we want to get a very very deep observation or we can get the computers to compare them to see if anything has flared between adjacent shots uh, and a whole science is now developed of actually searching for things that vary and there are debates about what's the right pattern of observations so one might be that you've got a patch of sky like this, you take four short exposures, maybe 30 seconds each. You take them maybe 10 minutes apart. Is that a good way to catch things? And then you go away and do something else and you come back again 28 days later and start repeating the pattern. Uh, the pattern, the cadence it's called, that you use will actually determine how rapid or how slow are the things that you pick up. But what is really important is if, like in this case, you find something has brightened, you must tell the world, or at least tell other astronomers, so that they can turn their telescopes to that thing as well. So a mechanism for announcing rapidly any changes seen is also important. And astronomers have that aspect well in hand. So a couple of examples, uh, one that's known as the Catalina Real-Time Survey. It uses some quite small telescopes, small by today's standards. Three telescopes in the USA and Australia. The biggest one is one and a half meters, then there's 70 centimeters and 50 centimeters. But between them, they can look at three quarters of the full sky. They've been doing this night after night since 2004 and they've found 17,000 optical transients, things that in visible light flare and die away, temporary brightenings. Now, they've managed to identify quite a lot of them. Uh, a number of them are what we call AGN, active galactic nuclei. These are the big black holes in the centers of other galaxies. Uh, we have a black hole at the center of our galaxy. It happens to be a rather tame one. I don't think anybody would describe it as particularly big. But many galaxies have a bigger black holes and, and they can be quite active. Uh, the next thing, SNE, stands for supernovae. These are exploding stars. Um, okay, they flare, they die. We used to have a wonderful classification system, two kinds of supernovae inspiringly called type 1 and type 2. <laughs> Actually, we then had to qualify it a little. We had to subdivide type 1 into 1a and 1b. But we've now found so many peculiar supernovae, I think that classification is way out the window. I think we have a mess of supernovae at the moment. And CVs, that stands for cataclysmic variables. 
only they're not actually cataclysmic. They can repeat. But these are dwarf stars that do dramatic flares. So dramatic, originally it was thought it was the, the last gasp of the star. It's not the last gasp, they can repeat. But those were the things that have been mostly found with this survey. They've plotted the data on the sky. It's a slightly unusual plot. The Milky Way runs across here. They've overprinted on a photograph, so you can see bits of the Milky Way along here. Uh, these bits lacking in objects are bits of the sky that are invisible. And the other things are colour-coded. So red are these supernovae, blue are the not cataclysmic variables, greens are the big black holes in the centres of galaxies, and magenta are other. And you've probably already spotted a track of magentas, which comes around here. On this kind of plot, this is the plane, it would be a plane in fact in three dimensions, this is the plane in which the sun and the planets move, the ecliptic plane. And what I believe they've got here is they've got a whole lot of minor solar system bodies, asteroids and lumps of rock and things like that. And uh, these will actually move, I'm not sure whether they've allowed for that and taken them out and these are the ones they still haven't dealt with but I'm pretty certain this is solar system stuff, this magenta. So there's a good number of objects. They're pretty well distributed over the sky, apart from those magenta things, and lots and lots of data. Another one that's been very successful and has just been upgraded and is starting again is on, on Mount Palomar, uh, Palomar Observatory. Uh, they had a previous uh, um, transient survey running. They stopped it to do some upgrades and they started again about six months ago. Um, they completely scanned the sky visible from Palomar in three days. Uh, they reckon that this facility is going to find 10,000 explosive transients every year. That's about three a night. That's going it a bit. They're also going to get four terabyte, terabytes of data a night and they've twigged they're going to have to use machine learning to handle this amount of data. They say after three years they'll have three petabytes of data. The numbers get a little scary. There are apparently an infinite amount, well maybe not literally, but a lot of transient events out there in the night sky which we were totally ignorant of until very, very recently. So some of these transient events, what kinds of things are they? I'm going to describe to you some of the more comprehensible ones. There's a lot where we don't really know what's going on. But one involves something called microlensing and this is due to Einstein who talked about the effect of gravity and how gravity can bend light. So on the left, we've got planet Earth. Um, this diagram is seriously not to scale. Um, big planet Earth, distant star on the far right, and the stars in our galaxy are all milling around. And every so often, you can end up with a temporary alignment where you've got two stars in line with the Earth. When that happens, the light from the distant star can be lensed by the gravity of the star in the middle. So that a light ray that was originally going to miss the Earth by miles gets bent, its track gets bent by the gravity of the middle star and it actually comes to Earth. And similarly with this ray, it gets bent and comes to Earth. So while we have this fortuitous alignment, this star is delivering much more light to the Earth than it usually does. In other words, it looks brighter, a lot brighter. But because the stars are all gradually milling around, it's only a temporary brightening. The alignment will go out of alignment quite soon, and that distant star will revert to its usual brightness. 
But interestingly, there's been some surveys running to, to look for this, and they've delivered some slightly interesting results. So again, I, I'll talk through this from the beginning. We start on the left-hand side. We have a distant yellow star. We have an intermediate star colored red, which is passing through, but there will be a temporary alignment. And when there is the temporary alignment, we get a lot of light from the yellow star. And then the alignment goes and the star goes back to normal. Now I suppose this intermediate red star has a planet. So here's the star and here's a planet. Planet comes along and lines up after the star has gone by. So we see the brightening due to the star and then a tiny little blip due to the planet. If the planet is more distant from the star, the gap between can be bigger, so the brightening due to the star and the brightening due to the planet. But what they have found is a brightening due to a planet and no star. No brightening due to the parent star. This planet is apparently an orphan. Or if you're feeling negative, a rogue. It must surely have had a star in the first instance. But maybe there's been a close encounter with another star and it's got pulled away from its parent and it's floating loose. They found something like a dozen of these orphan planets so far. So far. They were quite unexpected and we're guessing at their origins. We can do astronomy and do do astronomy at all wavelengths right across the spectrum. Indeed, optical astronomy using light covers a very, very narrow wavelength band, a narrow frequency band. And there's stacks of stuff either side of that narrow band that our eyes don't see, but astronomers can pick up. And it stretches, let's see, we'll have radio down that end. So there's radio waves, microwaves, infrared. Then we get into the visible spectrum, the bit we can see, the red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. And then it goes stuff that's invisible to our eyes, ultraviolet, and then X-rays, and then gamma rays. And these other wavelengths, besides optical, are also finding transient events. So I'm going to the that end of the spectrum, the high energy end, the short wavelength end, to talk a little bit about what the gamma ray astronomers see. And there's a, an amazing story here, which goes back to the early 1960s. The United States and the Soviet Union signed a test ban treaty. Neither would test nuclear weapons in the Earth's atmosphere. The US, being slightly suspicious guys, thought we'd better find some way to monitor this. We don't trust the Soviets. And they decided the best way to monitor this was to look out for a gamma ray flash, a short burst of gamma rays that a test bomb, a bomb being tested, would produce. And they decided the best way to do that was from space. So they launched a number of small satellites called the Vela satellites, and these must have been pretty early launches, because this was early 1960s. Um, they launched, you know, indeed we got an image, you know, fairly simple satellite, but they launched a series of these and they arranged that there would always be several up at a time, so that if there's a test down there in the Earth's atmosphere, this satellite can say it's there, this satellite can say it's there, and that satellite can say it's there, and they can prove it was over the Soviet Union, for example. So they got these satellites up, they got working, and they found flashes of gamma rays. Only they didn't come from over the Soviet Union, or certainly only maybe a few did. Indeed, when they began to work out where they came from, they realized they weren't coming from the Earth, they were coming from space. Something out in space was producing short bursts of gamma rays that these tiny satellites could pick up 
and it wasn't the Soviets testing nuclear weapons. But the work was classified. And even when the scientists work out that worked out that it was coming from space, not the Earth, it was a long time before they persuaded the authorities to allow them to publish. And it was the early 1970s before this became public. And it certainly wasn't the Soviets testing nuclear weapons. It genuinely was things out in space. Sorry, I got my dates wrong. It started in 67, not 63. Stories otherwise the same. So this is an image of one of the gamma ray bursts. Uh, it's a much later one. It comes from 1997, but it serves to illustrate. Um, this is done between 50 and 300 keV. And that's not actually what I would call a gamma ray. I'd call that an X-ray, but maybe that's semantics. Anyway, there is a very conspicuous burst, um, huge signal to noise, and it lasts mm, 10, 20 seconds probably. So once this work was declassified and published, there was immense interest. I was working with an X-ray astronomy satellite at that point, and many, many satellites have some protective mechanism to stop the sensitive detectors getting fried by inadvertent things, or there's a spot on the Earth called the South Atlantic Anomaly where the radiation levels are much higher. And I began to notice that uh, when there was a gamma ray burst, our protective mechanism switched everything off and then switched it on again after a minute or two. So this, this was interesting, this was exciting. I started doing some research on this, very, very primitive, I have a satellite, it's orbiting the Earth. Some of the gamma ray bursts we don't see, probably because the Earth is in the way. Some of the gamma ray bursts we do see because they're in the half of the sky that isn't blocked by the Earth. And such was the primitive information available at the time that that was useful information. So, immense interest in this. Complete puzzlement as to what they were. And this plot is, again, the whole sky, unpeeled like the previous plot I showed you. The Milky Way runs along the middle. And each of these dots is the position of one of the gamma ray bursts, position it came from, and the color gives the strength. And it's random, isn't it? They're just evenly spattered all over that oval which is a little bit surprising, because if we look at the stars in the night sky, they're concentrated towards the Milky Way. But this shows no concentration towards the Milky Way, which means one of two things. Either the sources of the gamma ray bursts are very, very close, and we don't see the more distant ones, so we don't see any concentration towards the Milky Way, or they're way beyond the Milky Way. They're nothing to do with our galaxy. They're external to the Milky Way. So, of course, they don't show any concentration to the Milky Way. And for many, many years, the debate raged. Um, meanwhile, we continued to record gamma ray bursts, typically about one a day. And while that burst is bursting, it's the brightest thing in the gamma ray sky. And we still don't know what they were. Uh, gradually, we came to realize there were two kinds of gamma ray bursts. This is something beginning to happen with other bits of transient work. This is a plot of the number of gamma rays against their duration. And there's one population like this, and there's another population like that, with the break point at two seconds. And with great in ingenuity, we call these ones short bursts, and these ones long bursts. Highly creative. However, we do all know what we're talking about, which is something. So we now believe that the long gamma ray bursts, longer than two seconds, are due to an, an exploding star, usually called a supernova, but if you want to hype it up a bit, you call it a hypernova. Um, supernova is the collapse of a star rather bigger than our sun. Hypernova is probably something even more super but a little bit undefined. 
and the star explodes and collapses to make one of these neutron stars or pulsars or maybe a black hole or maybe if they exist a quark star and somehow a lot of hand waving goes on here here's a collapse followed by explosion and somehow there's a pair of very narrow jets come out of this core that remains and if the jet is pointing towards us we see a gamma ray burst and if it isn't we don't The debate about where these long gamma ray bursts were was finally solved when uh, a satellite saw one and called up some colleagues on a telescope who were in the night sky, and that bit of uh, sky was in the night sky, uh, who turned their telescope there and found an object. So we have a before and after, done with slightly different telescopes, so the degree of speckledness is different. But it's the same field. I mean, you see three stars down here in the bottom left and a close pair up there to the right and a great big whopping star there, which is there. And then there's a pair. But here, there's only the right-hand one of the pair and nothing at the tip of the arrow. Or actually, there's something very faint. And that very faint thing has brightened enormously at the time of the gamma ray burst. And it turned out to be, that faint thing, a very distant galaxy. So these are extremely bright events. When the gamma ray burst is on, it's the brightest thing in the gamma ray sky. But it's also extremely distant. So they are whopping great events. And probably a very narrowly focused beam. So that helps with the energetics. And it turns out that a typical galaxy will produce one of these every million years, or a few of these every million years. Another type of phenomenon that we're beginning to see, and this is still very new, is called tidal disruption events. Uh, we have a black hole, maybe a black hole at the centre of a galaxy. Here's a star on a trajectory that's going to carry it dangerously close to the black hole. As the star gets closer to the black hole, the gravity, and in particular the difference of gravity, stretches it out into this cigar shape. And as it continues on its track, the cigar breaks up into lots and lots of bits which fall into the black hole one after the other. And each thing falling in could produce a flare of radio or gamma or X, or optical. And we are now starting to see these things. Um, at the last count I had, there were several dozen candidates for these tidal disruption events. But for me, the most exciting bit has been at radio wavelengths, things that the radio astronomers have found. Uh, just a little bit of physics. Um, apologies to the physicists in the audience. Many of you will know this, but here's just a little bit of revision. So you may know that when light shines through a raindrop, you get a rainbow. Or when light shines through a glass prism, you also get a rainbow. The different colours are spread out or separated. It's because the different frequencies of light travel at different speeds, different ways, through the drop or through the prism. And so they get separated out white light gets separated into its constituent colours. This is a phenomenon called dispersion, and we have a, a similar situation in radio. Um, I'm going to play you an audio recording in a moment. It's got quite a lot of static on it. What you are listening for is a descending whistle. <whistles> Something like that. So see if you can hear it in amongst the static. I think you heard it. <laughs> now, that is produced um, by a lightning stroke on the far side of the Earth. 
and named whistlers by geophysicists who were listening to radio emissions in the Earth's atmosphere and heard this whistle. Um, what is happening is the radio equivalent of the light getting split up into a rainbow by a raindrop or a glass prism. The thing originates from a lightning flash on the other side of the Earth. So, <coughs> lightning flash produces a very short burst of radio waves. Those radio waves travel around to this part of the Earth, guided by the Earth's magnetic field. And as they travel round, they pass a number of free electrons, which cause the dispersion. And the, the way it works is the high frequencies arrive first, followed by the lower frequencies. So you get this whistle. Uh, you can tell how far the radio wave has travelled by how slow the whistle is. Is it or is it In the latter case, it's been passed a lot more electrons. It's come further. So, lots of electrons spread the signal out. Lack of electrons give you a vertical thing. It's not dispersed. That also, that's a pair of nearby electrical signals that have produced a radio wave, but it's travelled no distance at all, and so it's not had a chance to get dispersed. So pulsar astronomers tumbled to this. And one slide on pulsars. Very, very small stars. There. Spinning. A very strong magnetic field at an inclined angle to the spin axis. And somehow, detailed yet TBD, a radio beam comes out from these conical areas near the magnetic poles, and as the star spins, the radio waves spin around the sky, the radio beams. And if the beam happens to fall on the Earth, we see a pulse once every revolution. The snag is, there's a lot of radio interference around, and there are other things that could cause pulses. So you need some way of distinguishing between a distant pulsar and a nearby something spinning that causes interference. And the difference is dispersion. The pulses that come round from the pulsar go whew, 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 whereas the nearby things go <coughs> So you check the dispersion. You look for that whistle to be sure that you're looking at a distant pulsar and not, you know, somebody in the next door lab with a piece of sparking equipment. <laughs> so radio astronomers always check the dispersion. And here's just a little bit of pulsar data. Start with the right-hand one, there's a pulse. And here's this curving whistle, descending note. Slightly noisier signal here, pulsar, descending note. So these pulses are from a distance. And indeed, you can use how rapidly this drops to estimate how far away the pulsar is. Absolutely standard. So, when a radio astronomer sees this and this, they say, ha ha, pulsar. The snag is, this has got a very, very, very slow decline. And you work out how many electrons have been involved in creating that slow decline. And you come up against a bit of a crisis. So let's suppose it's in that direction, and I'm the radio astronomer, and let's say I need 10 million electrons. I've no idea if that's the right number or not, but never mind. And I'm in a galaxy, and the galaxy ends here, where the carpet ends. So. Radio astronomer, right, I need 10 million electrons to explain that dispersion. I start counting. I've got 100, 200, 300, 400, 500. I'm nowhere near a million. And I've got to the edge of the galaxy. And the snag is when you get to the edge of the galaxy, the number of electrons drops, plummets. 
So to get the rest of the electrons I need, I have to go zillions of miles out there. It's way, way beyond the galaxy. Okay, it may be in a galaxy which will contribute some more electrons, but nowhere near enough. It's got to be thoroughly extragalactic. So that's interesting. And then they started finding more. And with one exception, they have monitored that bit of sky and that bit of sky and that bit of sky where these bursts have come from. With one exception, there has never been a repeat. So maybe it's something catastrophic. Maybe it's something been and gone and died in a spectacular way. And the optical astronomers where they have data say, no, we didn't see anything. And the infrared astronomers say, no, we didn't see anything. The X-ray astronomers say, yeah, we didn't see anything. But the radio people are picking up these bursts. Now, there is one case that has repeated. And they've studied it quite extensively now. Um, there's even a paper uh, just coming out. Uh, they've used deep learning on the data and they found lots more pulses from it. And they now know where it's coming from. And it's, not, it's in a galaxy, but it's not from the centre of a galaxy. It's, you know, out in the, the suburbs of the galaxy. And for God's sake, it's a dwarf galaxy. <laughs> and a dwarf galaxy says everything. There are, you know, we've got ten or something dwarf galaxies around the Milky Way. They're, they're pretty common. They're, they're dead tame. And it's not even in the centre of a dwarf galaxy. What is going on? Well, we don't know yet what is going on. And there's cre increasingly there's a suspicion that this one repeater is something different that we happen to have picked up because it gives some big pulses occasionally. For the rest, still no signals at any other wavelength. And they pop off totally unexpectedly anywhere. And they're all pretty distant. Um, typically at a redshift of between 0.5 and 1, so considerable distances. But the Australians had a problem. They were finding a number of things that looked a bit like these bursts, these fast radio bursts. They didn't look quite like the fast radio bursts. And they all seemed to have the same rate of descent of the whistle, the same distance. And they were really quite disturbed by this. And they couldn't make sense of it. Until a graduate student... I haven't got that plot, sorry. Graduate student made a plot of when these pulses arrived against local time. And there was a peak at 1pm. What do you do at 1pm? You have lunch. They have a microwave oven. <laughs> People were heating up their lunch. They weren't supposed to use it while there was observing going on, but they were. Uh, and actually, they weren't too worried about this microwave oven because they had tested it and it didn't you know, leak radiation. But listen to this, because this affects your health. Some people were putting their lunch in the microwave oven to cook and stopping the microwave by opening the door. If you stop a microwave by opening the door, there's a very short burst of microwaves gets out and hits you in the chest. Don't do it. A chest full of microwaves is not desirable. Please use the stop button and that will also prevent you from causing radio interference from this short burst of microwaves. So once the Australians had sorted that out, they were on board with the rest of us and agreeing that there are these amazing fast radio bursts. We still don't know what they are. They are at considerable distance. They don't seem to repeat. They don't give optical or x-ray or infrared or ultraviolet or gamma ray or microwave or anything, apparently. And we keep finding more and more of them. 
Have you heard about CHIME? New Canadian radio telescope just coming on air um, out in British Columbia. CHIME has found already a few of these bursts and I strongly suspect it's going to find a lot more which would be really interesting. It's at a slightly lower frequency than the radio telescopes that have picked them up up till now, which is interesting. Um, and it's very well placed to do it because it has a great combination of sensitivity and large sky coverage at any one time. So this is going to be really, really interesting. Um, whether it's just going to add to the number of known bursts and so not solve anything, we will see. Time will tell. There are other big new telescopes coming on to explore the transient world. The Large Synoptic Survey Telescope is building in Chile. It'll be a few years yet before it's fully ready. It's got a mirror that's 8.4 metres diameter. There's a person to scale. It has a camera that is the size of a small car with 3 billion pixels and it's going to produce a hell of a lot of data. <laughs> so much data that I think it's going to be a problem. Uh, it's going to catalogue 6 million solar system stars and 37 billion stars and galaxies. It's going to produce at least 10 million transient alerts every night. Grad students, don't go there. It'll be hard work. <laughs> Uh, they're going to have to use machine learning, obviously. But something that perturbs me just slightly is a machine computer will find what you program it to find, but will it find things that you haven't programmed it to find? Or will it say they're rubbish and throw them out? Anyway, there's going to be stacks of data from this new telescope, which is going to really shall I say, expand this field in an alarmingly rapid way. Uh, there's a big new radio telescope being built in Australia and South Africa. It'll have a collecting area of a square kilometre. There are now prototypes or pathfinders for this in both Australia and South Africa. And the South African one, they've done something, are doing something very clever. The, the radio telescope is called Meerkat. Those of you who know Dutch, Meer means more. Cat was the old Karoo Array Telescope. So Meerkat is more Karoo Array Telescope. And it's uh, as a cut down version of the, the ultimate telescope. It's going to you know, observe a particular patch of sky each night and so on. And they have put a small optical telescope right by it. And the optical telescope will cover the same patch of sky at the same time. So if the radio telescope picks up a flash, a radio flash, they'll be able to say, well, we had an optical telescope looking there as well. Did it see anything? So that kind of organized simultaneous coverage I think is going to be the only way to crack this in the long run. So that will be interesting. The final transient is the, the scoop of the century, gravitational radiation. I've been walking around a bit. I do tend to, I'm afraid. Um, you know that there's gravity between everything in this room, so there's gravity between you and me. But if I go over here, the gravity between you and me is rather less. The pattern of gravity in this room has changed. And that change in the pattern of gravity is already travelling out through space at the speed of light. It's very, very small. If I kept doing this regularly, then it would be rhythmic and there'd be a better chance of somebody detecting it. But actually, we really need things like black holes orbiting each other big, big masses. So this simulation from Wikipedia are the changes in gravity, the ripples in space-time, caused by a pair of stars orbiting round each other. And those ripples carry away energy. If 
you take energy away from a pair of stars, they move closer together and they go around faster. So the ripples get faster and bigger, which means more energy gets ca carried away. So the two stars move even closer, go around each other even faster, and the ripples get bigger and more energy gets carried away. And ultimately, the two stars will merge, collide with each other and merge. So there's been work going on now, at least in Britain, for about 40 years to develop equipment to pick up these waves. I think I've probably said all of this, as the two things orbit each other, they get closer, orbit gets faster, there's more gravitational radiation and they end up merging. So this is the kind of waveform that you look for um, if you're picking up gravitational waves. So it starts, it's a little low steady ripple, but actually the stars are getting closer, the ripple's getting closer packed, it's getting stronger and stronger and more and more close packed and more and more, and they merge. And this is in fractions of a second, so that's a tenth of a second along there. Uh, you can do it with neutron stars merging or black holes merging. And it's similar, it's broadly similar sorts of patterns. Uh, for the physicists, uh, this is what they call quadrupole radiation. And one of these Michelson interferometers is one of the best ways to pick them up. Uh, they do have a couple of these interferometers in the United States. Uh, one in the north of Italy. They're building one in Japan, which must be very nearly ready. And India is supposed to be building one as well. Uh, the gravitational wave passing causes the arm lengths of this interferometer to change. The mirrors at the end move just a little bit, a very, very little bit. Uh, the telescope or interferometer had four kilometer arms and the movement that they have picked up as the gravitational wave went by, 10 to the minus 18 of a meter, which is about the size of an electron or a quark. Technically fantastic. And they've done it. And they got a Nobel Prize for it, quite rightly too. So we now have had five mergers detected. Four of them were pairs of black holes. Black holes of a mass we didn't know existed. 20, 30 solar masses, and one, the most recent one, a pair of neutron stars merging. Uh, this is the, the waveform from the very first detection, the two black holes. Um, it's pretty noisy, but uh, two detectors, one shown in blue and one shown in the brownie colour. By about here, they're beginning to oscillate in phase. The amplitude's getting greater, the frequency's getting higher. Da, 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 and a merger, and then a bit of kerfuffle afterwards. So that is a huge achievement to have opened up this new kind of radiation. Uh, and they very rightly won a Nobel Prize for it. Uh, last, last year, no, 2017. Yeah, that is last year still. Sorry, we're not into 2019 quite. Um, last year, LIGO detected the merger of two neutron stars. And there was a short gamma ray burst, albeit a weak one, that went along with it. So we believe at the moment we've got the picture right, that it's a pair of neutron stars orbiting each other, sending out gravitational radiation, gradually getting closer and closer and closer and merging. And in addition to the gravitational waves, there's a short, narrow burst of gamma rays, which they managed to pick up as well. So that bit of the story is holding together well. So as you may have guessed, I'm hugely excited by this new branch of astronomy studying transient events. It's rapidly growing in um, scope and the number of people working on it. There's some fantastic new telescopes being built that will, I think, really shock us. Uh, and I'm certainly myself expecting interesting and dramatic results over the next few years. So I would say, watch this space. <laughs> Thank you for your interest.